All right, so welcome everybody to our CyberOps Associate uh, meeting for the week of the 25th. Thank you very much for bearing with me last week, folks. Um, my wife, again, had surgery. She's doing well. Uh, thanks for all for her ass. She's, uh, she's just sore, um, but she's, she's doing much better. In fact, she's downstairs taking a nap, kind of like most of us wish we were. Um, but I do appreciate, uh, again, your, your, um, your understanding about having to cancel last week. I thought I could get everything done, but it, it got a little overwhelming toward the end of the week when she was needing things and I was trying to be running class meetings and all that, so it was a, a bit tough. I do want to stress again and mention to you about this O'Reilly Media Database. Make sure uh, if you go to our Stanley webpage, okay, so if you're at our Stanley webpage and you are a current student, go to library, go down <clears throat> to resources, and then databases, A to Z. And this is a, in the course, I've listed O for O'Reilly, O'Reilly, and then it will ask you, Sometimes folks, if you've been logged in for a while, it kind of forgets your login. So you may want to sign out. I do that on occasion just to make sure it's getting the right stuff. We're too small to be listed here. So we're not listed in this list. So you go not listed, click here, put in your academic email, which none of that's, none of those are my emails and, and click let's go. And then you will be in the O'Reilly database, which gives you access to 35,000 books, 30,000 hours of various and sundry other stuffs, but we have for our class, uh, there's a playlist that is a um, CyberOps Associate playlist that has the book that was published in um, December 2020. So you can actually go in and see the, um, if I can just put in here CyberOps Associate and you will get the official CERT guide. So just don't forget that that's there as an additional resource for you above and beyond the class resources that are there. So you can use this to study for your test and to take your test. So just throw that out there um, for you to make sure you remember we've got that as an additional resource. I'm sure you've all got copious time to go in and, and, and read uh, all this stuff, but it is available for you to use. The other thing I wanna do is I wanna talk a little bit about, um, I do have a new toy. I bought me one of the, uh, any of those little tablets, uh, it's actually, start my video here for just a second, um, but it's basically this, um, and it's, is my video on? I don't think it is, maybe it is now, but it's just a little Enios tablet, it's like a Wacom Intuos or Intuos, it's one of the ones they actually are giving away as part of the um, Learnathon, which by the way, we placed third due to my stupidity, it was completely my fault. Uh, we had 189 participants, excuse me, 189 people signed up for the class uh, in my Learnathon class, but because they did not do a um, uh, quiz, we only had 86 participants. So uh, we were beaten uh, by the person in Missouri who had 130, um, but that was completely my fault. We should have won if I had done, done my due diligence. So uh, I will still be sending the Wycom tablet that we get from the contest um, back out uh, to a school, uh, and I will be sending out three pie tops um, to schools drawn at random from those 189 people who registered. Um, so expect an email coming up fairly soon on that. But with this little tablet, um, just because my handwriting's horrible, but it's still going to be something we can do here, folks. One of the things I want to think about is where do we put cyber ops? Um, one of the things I think you could see here is that with our one chapter, if we have a class on Windows, or if you have a class on Windows in your curriculum and you already have that before the CyberOps class, that would be helpful with chapter three. Uh, in fact, it would make chapter three almost unneeded. Likewise, uh, well, that wasn't something I meant to put there. Likewise, if we have um, a Linux class, now maybe the Linux Essentials would be a good little class here to put um, before you take CyberOps Associate. Okay, and then of course, if you do C, CNA one, whoops, one and two. Personally, I think this is something that absolutely needs to be before you take CyberOps. You might can get away without having a Windows and Linux class, but I really feel like that that is, you really need that before. Hold on one second, folks. I'm on, I'm actually downloading something on my Xbox that is 
Um, sorry, I was downloading Diablo Ultimate Edition since it's on Game Pass and it's killing my internet connection. So I have to go stop that. All right. But I really do think that you need CSA 1 and 2 before you do um, CyberOps Associate. Opinions, what do y'all think? I agree. Now I want I want to abbreviate associate there so we don't get in trouble. Um, so I think this, you know, any of these the pathway CCNA one and two here, if you could get in at least Linux Essentials before this, I think it will be very helpful. Um, for us in the state of North Carolina, a lot of us are doing this in Sec 160 because we replaced the CyberOps associate, um, replace uh, CCNA security. So that's kind of what we're doing here. Anybody not in North Carolina, what are y'all thinking about doing with CyberOps Associate? Anybody want to speak up? Or I don't think everybody. Sure, they, in this group I think they're thinking about off, offering as a, as a regular course after the CCNA. Okay, and well, that's what Sec 160 is for us. It's just an additional uh, full course, a three-hour course. Um, we have in the state of North Carolina. Um, we actually have. Uh, Net 125 for CSNA 1, 126 for CSNA 2, and 225 for CSNA 3. Uh, we used to have 226 for CSNA 4. Uh, a lot of people dropped 226. Some people are uh, looking at maybe doing DevNet in 226. Uh, right now, 226 is kind of up in the air. Um, those of you who are in North Carolina, Kirby and, and uh, um, other, Kirby and I say who else on there? Sorry, I'm brain Putin. Um, Kirby and Richard, if uh, you're interested in helping to, to think about what to do with 226, I'm open for suggestions, but I think maybe 226 could become DevNet. Um, I have one school that's doing CCMP Encore here, um, but that is just one school uh, that's thinking about doing that. Um, not real sure if others will do it. But if you look now, if we go from here and go back over to our course, one of the things I want you to look at um, especially as we look right here, there's 28 different modules. So when you look at this class, you kind of freak out a little bit because you think, how are we going to get through 28 modules in the time we have in a semester? Or, or, but let's look. If we go in here and we look at the Windows, this Windows operating system overview, nothing in this Windows would have been in any way, shape, or form difficult for a student who had had a basic Windows class, even if it was only right here, if this was just a workstation class. So if this was just workstation, I think you'd be fine. You know, and I say workstation, but just say like a Windows uh, 10 class, you would be perfectly fine for any portion of this module three here. Having gone through this, are there any questions about the modules? I mean, like here, I pulled up um, the labs. One of the labs is a PowerShell lab. So now this may be one thing they may not have worked much with inside of, um, uh, Windows Workstation. I haven't taught the Windows Workstation class in so long that I honestly can't even tell you what all is in it. Um, I'm not sure anybody can right now because of how weird the Microsoft certifications have become. Um, you know, and I may, somebody tell me if I'm wrong, but they, they really butchered their certifications last year. Um, I actually about this time of year because those of us who are all getting together right now remember the last time we actually saw each other in, in human form uh, was at our NCCIA in the first or second week of, of uh, March. So believe it or not, this insanity has been going on for over a year now um, or right at a year. Um, but they really kind of butchered their their whole setup for, for certifications. Um, but I still think a basic class, you would have all that you would need to be able to do these the labs that are inside of here and to understand like NetStat, to understand this, for instance, think about it. If you've been through Cisco one and two, you've already seen this because this is right in CCNA one. All right. Because we talk about the route table that is available on a, a PC or on a host. So that again is why I'm strongly recommended doing Cisco one and two before you do CyberOps. Yeah. Hey, Kelly. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, we it, and it just happened to work out in our information systems schedule that students were taking NOS 120 and NOS 130 
yep. before they would get to this class. That's awesome. Because NOS 130 is, is the Windows client. Yep. NOS 120 is the Linux client. So, so yeah, the, these chap, this chapter three and four would almost be nothing but a review for them when you hit it. Yeah, you know. for us in the state of North Carolina, folks, this is basically you're looking at this right here. And what I really see CyberOps Associate as in a two-year degree program, I see this as probably a fall or a spring class, just depending on how you do your, uh, how you normally do your, but second year is what I see here. But you're right, you know, you basically there, if they hit this, even if, especially if it's spring of the second year or a two-year degree program, they're going to have all the Linux and Windows knowledge. So what I want you to be aware of is that it's okay to blow through these chapters if your students are going to have that knowledge already. Okay. Same thing with Linux. I mean, when you look at the basic Linux that's in here, I mean, it is very simple Linux stuff, but it is important as we move forward and start working on other items um, to know how this works um, so that the other labs are a little bit easier when you get in using security onion and those types of things. But from a pacing standpoint, I want you to think about your students and think about if they are already through with this, you know, you're looking at module one and two. So we look at modules one and two, you're gonna spend, you know, you're gonna go through them. They're already pretty short. Modules three and four, you may not even have to spend any time on hardly at all because if you've had Windows and Linux, they're covered. Then we get over in here and let's look at modules five through basically almost all the way down to 11. You know, so we look at network protocols and we look at the process. This is straight out of the Cisco one. I mean, I mean even some of the, even the, many of the pictures are the same um, that you will see, you know, tracing the path, looking at these. Um, it is straight out of Cisco one. So in many ways, you now have the possibility of saying, okay, for my students, we are able to then take five through really 11, because you look out here, you know, this is learning what a, what a, literally what a router is, what an end device is. That picture, I know you, if you had Cisco one, you know, because it's got the satanic network there in the middle. I always pick about that with the little satanic uh, symbol in the middle there. But it's just routers, switches, what they are, encapsulation, de-encapsulation. So now we're looking at taking this course and saying, all right, my students have had Cisco one and two. So I'm gonna be able to take five through seven. Okay, so right here, I'm gonna take five through seven and quick review. I mean, that's all you can do here. And that's true also for your three and four. All right, so these whole first, or excuse me, not five through seven, five through 11, okay? Because you probably, could quite honestly cover in the first two weeks of your class, you could cover all of these, one through 11. And then now you're gonna jump in and you're gonna say, okay, now we're gonna pick up right here and we're gonna start looking at 12 forward. And that really leaves you with 12 through 26, 28 um, to get knocked out. Now, let me ask you this, in this group right here, um, and I can do a poll, show of hands, whatever. I'm going to add a question here. Actually, let me see if I can add a question. I can't add a question easily. Let me just try. Kelly, I don't know if it's on my end, but I'm losing you. Okay. Yeah, I'm losing him too. I'm, he's going in and out. He's, he's fading. You know. Okay, let me, let me try to slow down a little bit. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Do this for me in chat. Tell me if you've had Cisco 1 and 2 in the chat, if you've had Cisco one and two yourself. Okay, so Gail has you not. You say one and two, you mean the, the introductions and networks and the routing and switching? Right, right. Uh, either uh, intro to networks and routing, switching wireless essentials or routing and switching essentials, either one, version six or version seven. When you say you had, that means you've taught them or you've taken them? You've taken them, you've taken them. Where's the poll? I don't see the poll. Well, just, just tell me. Just put it in chat. And so, so Kelly, my no probably isn't really fair. Okay. Uh, because number one, I'm not a networking instructor. I'm actually an operating system instructor. Okay. So, 
sorry, the, the Linux section in the Cisco course, like, all right, it, it's all archaic and Linux yeah. is past it, but that's okay. Um, it is. Um, the, the other thing, and, and I'm not just an operating, I mean, operating systems is my, my passion, but really right. I'm a, I am a cyber, you know, engineer. I mean, okay. I did cyber for 35 years for the federal government. So okay. yes, I may not have taken Cisco one and two, but I definitely know the material in Cisco one and two. Okay, good. Well, and, that, and the reason I asked Gail is I don't want to, I'm not even going to really spend any time going over five through 11 with this group, because I feel like, um, even, you know, Robert, you said you took it a couple of years ago. All of this is the same as the last version of CCNA, six or seven. So I just want to, I just want to make sure that I'm not making a mistake by not covering that with, with everyone here. Um, so that, you know, if you're, if you're comfortable, Gail, now I will say this, if you've had no networking and you don't have a background in it and you're not comfortable then you really need to go over five through 11 yourself and look at it and ask me any questions uh, in this class that you may have. But I do want you to, to realistically ask your students, just like you said, Gail, you know, the Linux portion here is such a, a, a minimized overview that it may not even be worth going over with your students. They might would laugh at it depending on what your students and how much Linux they have in your course. Um, with with our setup and the way, way it's, you know, like I said, if you're taking NOS 120, you would be in great shape for our students in North Carolina to go to, to basically skip that area completely um, or at least blow through it very fast. So I just wanna, just wanna make sure I didn't wanna mess up and not go over something that, that you needed as a class. Um, but if you're comfortable, then we'll, we'll move on. We'll look at the network security infrastructures. So. Any questions about any questions about how you would set this class up to teach in terms of where you're going to put it in your curriculums? Now, this is a good question. Feel free to unmute yourself and tell me how many of you are going to put this in a cybersecurity to your degree or in a networking to your degree as an additional class? All right, we so put it this in is... networking. I, I'm going to tell you, we put it as an additional class in our networking degree. So, so this is Gail again, and here yep. at Augusta Tech, it's actually one of our capstones that in our cyber degree. So okay. the students take it at the end. Um, they are required to take CCNA one and two. Um, okay. They are required to take a Microsoft operating systems class and a Linux operating system class and a number of other you know classes in there too. So um, the way you were talking earlier, where it would be the fall or spring of the second year is that that works perfect for what we are currently implementing okay excellent and richard you said it's additional class in networking for you too and i think kirby you probably follow the same as us with a networking degree um, yeah well our um at, at randolph we've got a network and cyber security together okay uh, we didn't have enough people to have two separate ones we put those together and it would have to be, in fact, uh, I was not even considering doing CCNA security. I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do now because I'm waiting to see in May yeah. what security offers. But my intention is that we've replaced Net226 with a CCT250, the network vulnerabilities. Okay. And um, so that class uh, could fit either CCNA security or cyber ops. So that's kind of what we're looking. I'll have to make a decision over the summer. Okay. Um, the other thing to think about that one, too, uh, for network vulnerabilities would be an ethical hacking class. Yeah, we actually uh, have that planned also. So now I got too much material. I got to figure out where I'm, where I'm going to put it all. Okay. And Robert mentions it's going to be part of uh, the four-year degree track for networking. Excellent. I, think, I do think this is a good class to put into either security or networking. Um, the reason I like it, and obviously it, it fits security excellent because it's front level, you know, level one SOC. It fits networking because it gives that student an additional skill that they could use on their resume, uh, which will give them the ability to, you know, to continue uh, to be more hireable, um, to use a, a term there. All right. Um, I do want to show you just real quickly, uh, mentioning uh, CCNA security. Um, this is, and I'm, I know I've shown you all this before, but I've spent the last, the entire week building um building pods for CCMP. Um, but one of the cool things about this tool is it does have in it uh, legal virtualized versions of IOSs. 
So you could literally come in here and you could put an ASA V in here um, and simulate the internet, uh, put PCs in here, and then you just connect gig to gig zero. Um, and then we got to go out here and we got uh, on the ASA, let me go in here and add an interface on the ASA. Add four interfaces on it, which I did. So now we're going to go in here and say this will be the internet. So we'll go gig zero one. Actually, you know what? Let me let me let me delete this link here. So I, I like little little anal here, but uh, we'll do gig zero zero on the outside and gig zero one on the inside. So it's just the way I like to do it. And then we could come in here and continue on and build out a, um, an entire network. But it, you can see here when you actually boot, um, boot the devices, I'm gonna go back out and just boot the whole lab at one time, but it'll start booting and that's a fully functional ASA um, virtualized. Okay, that's good. You can do add say 260 when we move 226. So you can have either the CCNS or that, okay. That's a yeah. good idea. Because SEC is already, well, you've got a combined degree. So you, the SEC uh, prefix for you is already a prefix that's available inside of your to your degree. Right, right. Gotcha. Which we have a lot of flexibility with that too, with the way the way our systems are set up now. With our our programs. But again, this is just a little little setup here to show you kind of what, what you can do, but that's the ASA. Um, and they are working on, again, different ways that maybe we could, as educational institutions, consume CML and not have to pay an absolute arm and leg. Plus, having it inside of a Cis or a NetLabs pod just makes it so much cleaner from scheduling and taking care of things and making sure things are actually um, um, basically erased and cleared up. But Kind of neat to have, you know, like I said, full ASA sitting here, ready to go. Yeah. And it's a virtualized iOS uh, for the ASA, but it does show you there that it can do VPN peers, it can be, it can do all kind of crazy stuff. But neat, neat tool. Um, Something that may want to look at for C State Security down the road. All righty. Any other questions about where we would put this thing or how we would use it in our programs? I'm going to hit, uh, and I know this is way down the road from where we're at, folks, but I'm still just going to go ahead and run through this module real quickly because I don't think it's um, that difficult. And in fact, you will see that this is continues on with what we have done with. Um, the CCNA portion or the networking portion through chapter 11, looking at our different representations of end devices, intermediary devices and our medias that we have. And then we do talk about the difference between physical topologies and logical topologies. So the way things are physically connected versus the way data moves throughout your network. Once again, concept straight out of um, CCNA. One of the things we don't really go over as much as we used to um, was what we call the CDA, Core Distribution Access Layer Design. Um, this particular model is a model that is part of Cisco's, um, a little bit, I won't say it's an older design model, but it is, it's been around a long time. Um, and in this model, you obviously have a core layer which focuses on just this, this speed, as speed and redundancy, as fast as you can get uh, data to move through the core, get it to move. And normally off of your core is where you would have your um, your server block down in your main data center. Then you have your distribution layers, which are in years past, these distribution distribution layers would be, um, let me go ahead and try something. Let me see if I can do this. Actually, I'm going to do it a different way. I'm going to do it with not paint, but let's see if I can do it with a stupid tool. Back in the old days, we had a, and yeah, I'm playing my new tool, y'all, sorry. Let me see if I can do this. 
a little small, but but back in the old days when we were working in here, the links from here to here would have been a layer two link. All right, out to our buildings. But what we started doing now is these distribution layer. This is now a building, so we're going all the way out to a building. And in that building, what we're actually doing now is we're doing layer three. So from here to here, out to the building, instead of having our layer two VLANs go all the way back to our core, this is a layer three boundary so that we have the ability to um, summarize between buildings. A great example, I'll give you an example in our, at our school, is between our buildings, we have 10.102.0.0 16. I'm not really giving anything away here because those are internal private numbers, but still, this is our building. Every subnet in our building is off of this. So 10102 10, something. So we're able to summarize from our building back to the core. So the core can have one route that allows it to um, route everything up to our building. Same is true for all the buildings on campus. This ensures that broadcasts don't pass building boundaries and that we have a little uh, more control over what goes into the core. It does mean that you have to route out um, from the core. Um, you can do that with, you know, you can have internal routing protocols such as OSPF, uh, EIGRP, or you can do static routes just depending on what you want to do. But this is that core distribution and access layer design that has been changed from a layer two boundary now to a layer three boundary right there. Questions about that? Do you, me and you, uh, oh, what's her name? Um, she wrote the book on on this. Priscilla, I think was her was her first name, but um, there's an entire book called Top Top Down Network Design, and its entire basis is looking at the difference between the core distribution and access layers. Distribution, by the way, is where we do put our security um, features, our security implementation, such as ACLs. And then the access layer just provides access to our end devices. Now, the problem with this, what do you think the problem is with this, this model? Can somebody tell me a problem you see from it right now? Anybody see a problem? Anybody bought a Cisco 9000 series switch lately? Well, there's your problem, folks. What Cisco's recommending out here, okay. Ooh, my pad died. Are y'all gone? Did I lose everybody? You didn't lose me. Okay, we're well, good. The problem is if in, with Cisco's designs, what they're wanting you to do is they're wanting to put a 9,000 level switch in as a distribution layer switch, and you're looking at $15,000 or more. So you're looking at 30 grand in distribution switches per building. Most people can't afford this design layer. So we end up with something more like this. We have more of a collapsed core where the core and distribution are combined. Then you have your access layer and it is made up of cheaper switches that are not, uh, not as capable, but not as expensive as others. Now, the problem with this is it's more flat and it's much more difficult to do the layer three boundary at your buildings. Um, so that's one of the problems with a collapsed core design. Questions about that? All right, let's talk about DMZs. Here is a couple ways to look at uh, a firewall router. This, by the way, is their, um, what they, the symbol they use for a router that has firewall capabilities. So I have a public untrusted and private trusted. The DMZ would be a link off of this firewall that goes into a DMZ area so that you could have um, access to resources that need to be accessed from the public untrusted, but you don't want to open up your inside. So you've got basically a dirty network, a clean network, and then you've got a gray network that's not being shown right here, but that would be your DMZ uh, that is available. So. Firewalls, there's all different types now. There are next gen firewalls, there are ASAs, there are packet filtering firewalls, there are stateful firewalls. There are um, firewalls now that have the ability to connect to 
systems that do heuristic and um, adaptive AI scanning um, to find different uh, information. By the way, I read uh, yesterday, I believe it was, that Palo Alto uh, was able to avoid the SolarWinds hack because of their system that did um, anomaly detection and AI-based uh, looks at uh, what was going on in their network. It actually blocked the solar winds attack for them. So they would have been caught in that attack if not for the fact they were running it. Now, um, you may have heard of Wildfire, which is uh, one of the advanced suites of products available from Palo Alto. Um, we actually just turned on Wildfire for our data center um, and we're using it now to examine all traffic going in and out of our data center. Um, I don't know if everyone's aware, but there've been several pretty high profile hacks of community colleges in the state of North Carolina. Um, Central Piedmont Community College is currently in the middle of being down. I know they've been down at least two days this week. Um, there are others that have been affected. Um, so we're all kind of circling the wagons, um, so to speak, to ensure that everything is locked down. But the firewalls come in many different shapes, forms, and fashions. Um, they're even host-based firewalls, so just firewalls for your local machines. Um, Palo Alto has got a good firewall. Uh, the ASA is a good firewall. A lot of people, though, are trying to use, you know, Checkpoint, are trying to use a different vendor for their firewalls versus their internal equipment. Does anybody know why? Why would you want to use a different firewall versus your internal equipment that you have? So you got an all system. Go ahead, Gil. Because the adversary will know, would be able to know more about your system. So if you use the same equipment all the way throughout, right? Yep. The challenge is, is that if I can get into one, well, now I can get into the rest of them where the, the thought pattern is. That's but there's the also there's also a, a negative side to do. I mean, that's the positive side to doing it, right? That's the security side. But there's also a negative side to that, whereas it costs a lot more money in implementation because now you have to keep engineers who know and understand you know both both systems and whether you you know if you're small then you have to have one person who's a jack of all trades and possibly a master of none over right and that is the gail that's the the, the huge trade-off is exactly what you said the idea is that we're going to put in many different layers and so there's going to be different pieces of the onion so you have to learn both palo alto and cisco but the problem is like you said in small organizations they don't learn the palo alto well enough and so, or they don't learn Cisco well enough and you end up with problems because they're not an expert. Um, so there's always debate on any type of security implementation. Um, there's good and bad both ways. The other thing people would say is, well, if they're all the same vendor, they're so tightly integrated, I can ensure that the, the Cisco IPS and the Cisco source fire stuff and everything works perfectly together. So they're gonna better protect the network. Um, so it, that is always one of the big things to consider. And I think, you're, I think that is the key for your students is make sure they know that everything in security is a trade-off. Um, you know, the more secure it becomes, the less accessible it is. Accessible it is. If you um, build the most secure network in the world, it's just gonna be put in a safe and thrown, you know, in 10 tons of concrete thrown in the ocean and put on the bottom of the, the ocean. Extremely secure, not very useful. Um, so that's that's one of the big things there. So very good, very good description. So here we're looking at packet filtering firewalls that can do um, you know layer layer three, layer four. Um, you got staple firewalls have the ability to look at session traffic to actually go up and, and look at different flows. Application gateway firewalls try to look at up to layer seven. And then next gen, they're showing here obviously the ASA. But next gen firewalls are trying to do all of this, plus they're trying to do a lot of it in circuitry and ASICs to make things fast. Because one of our big discussions we've had all week is if we turn on this level of inspection of traffic going in and out of our data center, what is going to be the effect on our throughput? Because the second you start, you know, we start decrypting packets, you know, put in a decryption uh, policy. And there's a lot of lot of discussion about that because quite honestly, Palo Alto firewalls and Cisco firewalls have the ability to decrypt um, SSL traffic and look inside of it. Well, what does that mean for people who are trying to access websites securely? 
Um, you know, there's there's a lot of lot of discussion there. Um, but same thing, I can't look inside of the SSL traffic to see if someone's tunneling DDoS traffic. So there's a trade-off. Am I willing to 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 do the overhead to look up at SSL decryption policy and also decrypt the SSL traffic or Am I willing to let that go and just look for large amounts of it and try to determine that that's an anomaly? All of that's in our next generation firewalls. I have the ability to do that. Questions about firewalls. How many, how many of you worked with, I've never, I'll be honest with you, I've worked with Palo Alto and I've worked with ASAs. Um, I've obviously also worked with Cisco's Windows Defender and some just the host-based firewalls. Uh, I've never worked with Checkpoint. Um, what's some other ones? I don't, I'm trying to think of other vendors. Checkpoint obviously is one. Um, yeah, it does. You're very, very true. It breaks connection to many sites. Um, okay, 300 sites on the list of bypass. It. Okay, that's interesting because I would figure that some sites would reject the ability for you to open the SSL traffic um, and look inside of it. Good point. Very good point. Let me ask you this, uh, Robert. Um, is when you say there's 300 sites in the bypass, do you have to manually put those in, or is that something that's being fed to you from a like a central central type thing? Let's see, I have a chat here. PFSense, okay, yeah, PFSense is a very good one. Okay, you had to manually put them in. Okay, at that, that I could see that being aggravating, most, most definitely. So basically you have to have your users tell you, hey, this site's not working and you have to put it in. Okay. PSS is a good one. Um, you know, IP tables is an open source firewall, but it's a packet packet filtering firewall. It's a very simple packet filtering, but it's it's available. Good, excellent. Um, IDS versus IPS. Just remember that IDS is intrusion detection. So it's just gonna tell you something's going on IPS attempts to do something about it. The problem with an IPS is it could start bit bucketing stuff that you don't want to be bit bucketed. Um, and so um, depending on how tight things are, if it's a false positive, you can end up with legitimate traffic getting put in the bit bucket. Um, we all have experienced this when emails that should have not gone into our spam filter go into our spam filter. Imagine if network traffic did the same thing. You had network traffic leaving your um, your network and or coming into your network and never getting to a user, just getting dumped in a bit bucket. So I do one thing here, uh, the difference between an atomic pattern and a composite pattern. An atomic pattern is a single packet. Uh, you think about atomic patterns because think about a nuclear weapon, it either goes off or it doesn't. There's no small nuclear explosion. You either have it or you don't have it. Um, so it's atomic, single packet, whereas composite has a, could be an attack that's broke across multiple packets. And most good attacks are going to try to make themselves appear to be um, multiple packets and to be legitimate traffic. So IPSs, host-based, network-based, obviously, where do you put your IPS? You could put it inside of your DM, DMZ. So the, on this firewall down at the bottom here, in front of the web server and the DNS server, there's a, a sensor that is doing IPS. And then likewise, there's a sensor between your firewall and your internal screening um, router, and then another one on the inside of that. You'll notice if you did this, then you talk about expensive, that becomes extremely expensive to put those kinds of, of those number of IPS sensors into your network. And then, you know, honestly, what Cisco's wanting you to do is to put in these specialized appliances that are designed to look at traffic as it goes through your network. So the advanced malware protection, which looks at you know emerging threats, it's constantly updated. Um, you've got it as part of what they call their Talos research group. So as they find new attacks, they immediately roll it out to AMP. Same with the web security appliance. It basically is a, a gateway that looks at all traffic, application traffic going to and from that is web-based and attempts to risk block risky sites. Um, this is similar to the wildfire uh, abilities of Palo Alto and that they're looking for sites they know are malicious and adding them to uh, this web security appliance. And then you got an email security appliance, which is 
designed for all your email to go through so that it can uh, do real time uh, removal of malware, real time uh, reduction in spam, all of those types of things that you can do. You can even uh, imagine that you can have it looking for uh, particular types of information inside of an email. So it can get to the point to where if an email is trying to send out information that would be considered intellectual property, it can be flagged and either stopped and or at least logged so that you know that a particular type of file was placed onto a or into an email, which is pretty interesting. The negative of these devices, every time you add a device to your network, that device is going to slow your network down because you now are analyzing traffic and you're having to break it apart look at it, put it back together. So that's always an issue. A lot of our security services, we're trying to, obviously we can use ACLs, basic access control lists. Um, these are for the most part, even with extended ACLs are just source destination ports, source destination protocols. Um, so pretty, pretty simple use of ACLs there. This is Again, straight out of CCNA, talking about that. SNMP, uh, using it to manage or look at our, our network and allow nodes to send traps to an SNMP manager. Just be careful because SNMP, unless you're running version three, has some security holes in it. Um, so you wanna run the latest version and make sure you're not seeing it. running a service that's actually gonna be a hole on your network. NetFlow looks at flows allows you to look at uh, flows going through. Now, the beauty of NetFlow is it only looks at these items. So basically source, destination IP address, source, destination ports, protocol type. Um, so what it tries to do is look at flows and analyze how they're being used and what is going on in a flow. Um, it can then analyze it and say if something is being done that's an abnormal use of traffic. Um, you know, if you're seeing large amounts of uh, net flow or, or excuse me, flows from, from two devices that should not be sending traffic to one another, you can do that. Um, we're gonna possibly use this to do some studies on uh, the automatic um, changing of buffer sizes on switches, some of these programmable switches to see if it can increase uh, the ability of switches to handle traffic faster, kind of interesting. Port mirroring, also called spanning on Cisco devices. Um, typically, you cannot see traffic on a switch that goes between two devices. But what you can do is you can span that port or mirror it. It's called port mirroring, but in Cisco, they call it spanning a port. So basically, you put your sniffer out here, and you'd say all traffic that comes in these ports or goes out these ports also go out to this packet analyzer and that puts the, the packet analyzer will be in uh, promiscuous mode and it would take all that traffic in. And then you can look at it for nefarious behavior. Syslog, we all know what a syslog server is. It just allows you to, to monitor your network devices. The big thing about, I will tell you is that make sure uh, on your network, you do have NTP or network time protocol set up correctly so that when you are trying to prosecute someone who's broken into your network, the timing, the time on your syslog files and on the files that you have in your uh, security event and information system is correct. That way you don't get, someone doesn't get off because of a, uh, just a dumb mistake, quite honestly. You want those dates and times to be correct. Okay, you look at your stratum, stratum zero is time for an authoritative time server. So high, very high precision time devices, stratum one directly connected to those. They act as your network's time standard. And then under that, you've got your stratum two and stratum three servers, which get their information from the upstream NTP servers. AAA, the big thing here is difference between TACUS and RADIUS. Um, TACUS is TCP. Um, it is and was for many, many years Cisco proprietary. It's actually not Cisco proprietary anymore. It's a more open standard now, but it is mostly supported by Cisco. Um, it does encrypt the entire packet instead of just the password, um, but it has limited accounting abilities. 
Um, one thing to remember is it does run mainly on TCP. So TACUS, T, TCP. Radius, this U here tells you it runs on UDP. If you need a way to remember which one uses what, TACUS, T, radius, U. So TCP versus UDP. Radius is an open standard. It has extensive accounting abilities. Um, but again, it only has unidirectional challenge and it only uses the password encryption. It doesn't encrypt the entire packet. Last but not least, VPNs, which again, I feel like most of you are already familiar with. One of the things that you may not be familiar with is the concept of MPLS, which is inside of your provider's cloud. They are actually using what amounts to um, almost really VLAN tagging for this MPLS, but they're tagging your traffic as you go through their, um, their ISP cloud so that only your information can go to your sites and vice versa, so you won't be accidentally grabbing data from another site. And folks, that's chapter 12 in a nutshell. Um, and I know that's way ahead of where we're supposed to be, um, but I wanted to hit that because I feel like everybody's kind of uh, comfortable with the other items in our class so far. And then we'll pick up with chat module 13 next time, which will be next Thursday, and move on from there. Are there any questions? I'm gonna stop my share. I won't stop the, the recording yet because that way if you have any questions, other folks would be interested in. Any questions on the class? Any problems with the class so far? I've noticed a lot of you are using our net labs for your labs, which is excellent. Please continue to do so. Um, that's what they're there for. We have almost 20 different pods available for you to use. So please feel free to use those. Feel free to build it locally if you're gonna do that for your students. Um, but it, our net labs is available for you to use if you, if you need it for your labs. Yeah. Uh, Kelly. Yes, sir. I've got a, a question just to refresh my memory when we're in the net labs and we use the, um, oh God, what the snapshot feature screenshot feature. Screenshot. Yeah, that'd be fine. That's fine. Yeah. yeah if you want to do that, use the screenshot feature and you can actually save it. And that way you want to try to copy it out to your, and if you do that, just put on your, uh, your lab submission. Um, save screenshots in NetLabs, and I can just go look at them there. That's perfect. Okay, I was I was just curious when we when we take the screenshots, just where do where do they go? Is they go into goes? your. Um, let me jump back over here, and I'll show you. Um, whenever I do a like, if you've done, if I go in here and look at uh, usage, mm -hmm. uh, and I just do labs, and I pull up the class itself. Let me go ahead and pull the class up. Um, it will be under, if you've done any screenshots, like for instance, I was doing this lab, if I had done any screenshots, it would have been right here. Okay. So I can so always go and look at those. Um, okay. So that's just something you look at, not us after we take them. Correct, yep, that's just something I look at. And you can do, I think up to 12 screen, there's somebody did a screenshot right there. Okay. Probably did one on that one. So see, so he's got that sitting there. And there's all the screenshots that he did. So then this, if you've got Nail Labs, this is an excellent way. If you've got, if you're doing uh, operating system classes, this is an excellent way to have your students turn in their work because guess what? There's no way anybody but, if, if I look in here and that was Kirby, right? There's no way anybody but Kirby could do that screenshot. You know, if you have it where students uh, do a snip, you know, if they snip it, well, they can take a snip and, and their classmate can give it to them. But this is under Kirby's login, Kirby's lab. Nobody else could do it but Kirby. Well, of course, he could have somebody do the lab for him, I guess. But it's a lot harder than I to actually do the lab. So um, if, you have the, if you have the product, this is an excellent way to ensure students are doing the work. Good job, Kirby, by the way, with the screenshot here. Excellent example. Everybody's teacher's pet, right? Right. <laughs> yep, exactly. Okay, folks, um, that's all I've got. Um, please stay in contact with me. I'll send a link out for next Thursday's meeting, same time, three to four, and uh, keep working. Um, and we'll, we'll go from there. Remember, you don't have to do all the labs. So if you feel like the labs from, from basically all the networking parts are, are below you and you feel like you know them, then move forward and do the labs uh, further out. Um, and we'll get, we'll get going. The only lab you haven't activated all the, is the final. What the, the what's the final one? I think the final lab is there. Um, you can schedule it. 
if you want to. Um, when you do, when you go in here to do the final hands-on lab, uh, it is actually in here. It's right here. I didn't see it in the in the net net lab. Yeah, it's, it's right here. I'm in net labs right now, and this is if you look when you go to do your labs. I can't you see you not sharing your desktop. Oh, oh, dad, give it. Sorry, I'm a doofus. I'm sitting there showing it to you. Okay, so I'm in our class right now. Yeah. So right here, this is the final exam. Oh, that's the, that's what it is. Okay, usually yeah. you're used to going into the first one. Yep. Okay. Yeah, if you go into the second one, you just click here, pick your pod, and away you go. Okay. I would definitely make that a four-hour reservation when you do the hands-on final. Okay. What does that consist of? It is uh, taking the security onion and looking at an attack and making some decisions about what kind of attack it was, when it took place, what the result was, why it took place. It's really looking at an attack and, and doing an analysis on it. So we're not hardening the devices or anything? No, no, you're not. You're, you're basically, remember, this whole class is designed for you to be a SOC level one analyst. Right. So you're going to look at an event and decide if you need to, if this event is bad enough to move up to level two. And you so actually we, go a little bit further. So we'll I, would be, you're doing, I would say you're doing a little bit of a level two look at the at the event too, because you're digging pretty deep into the event to see see what took place. So we're going to submit to you what we think about it, what we found. No, it's got, and what it's we'll got the it's actually got the questions. It's got questions in it. So, oh, okay. Okay. I mean, if I go in here, you can't obviously can't see. Well, I'm gonna just I'll just real quickly do it. I'll just jump in here and do one. It's I got tried to preview, light. but it said it wasn't available. Yeah, there's no preview because they don't want you looking at it and cheating. <laughs> um, but I, I don't consider cheating just to show you a basic of what it is. Um, give it a second to boot here and we'll... Come on. I was just wondering if I had to memorize. I probably will for the final exam, but I have trouble memorizing all of the names of the different software. No, and no, you won't. I mean, basically, it's, it tells you to log in. And then you're going to look at the different information, the basic information, and then list the alerts noted, list IP addresses. So it's just basically looking at, you know, what the attack was and, and what information you can gather about the attack using Security Onion. And it tells you what tools to use. So you don't have to memorize the tool names or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thanks. No problem. Hey, Kelly, do you know if it's Security Onion 2, the latest one, or is it the... I think one. it's the it's still the older version. It's still the older version right now. I think they're going to move forward, but that's right now. I'm pretty sure it's I mean, we can look. Uh, yeah, because they, they've pulled out a couple of uh, they've swapped tools around a little bit. Right. I, I'm pretty sure it's uh it's still the still the older version. It's this one, the, the older version. So of what I peeked at, of what you had there, it looked like it was the older version. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. Pretty sure. Okay. Which is fine. I mean, they just came out with a newer version, like. Right. Um, Which I will probably. I mean, I expect them to probably change that in a couple months. Well, probably six months or so, um, just because you know, they, they they hopefully they won't do it real quick because we've got enough changes going on in the academy right now. I understand what you're saying, but if you have any uh pull with Cisco, you might want to suggest to them that they update their Linux because it, yeah, it, is, yeah. it is really bad. I mean, I can't speak for the window, the, yeah, the Windows side, because I'm not really right. a Windows person, but from the Linux side, I was like, oh my gosh, I tell my students that these don't exist anymore. <laughs> right. And then that's something I will mention to them, especially in that little Linux chapter, because it is something that's definitely needed. So, all right.